Again, I'm Mark Toll from Panasonic. Um, I'm a, a technical specialist, I guess you would call it from Panasonic. I'm not a salesperson. I'm more of a technical person, but I've been a photographer for, um, oh my God, for, for 50 years. I've worked in photo processing. I've worked in uh, being a professional photographer. And today's um, presentation is on street photography, which is, it's funny, I've never done this presentation before because it's my, it's my love. It's my passion is street photography. And I've always been kind of nervous about um, uh, trying to tell people about it. So um, you guys are the, are the first try here uh, at this class. And uh, let me open the Q&A window here um, just to see, see if I can keep, and uh, Heather, again, if you see anything there, let me know. So I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna do a presentation. Feel free to put questions in the Q&A and we'll answer them at the end. If one is pertinent to what I'm talking about, Heather will uh, interrupt and let me know what it is. Okay, so let me share my screen here. And I'll tell you, uh, first of all, let me, let me explain what the presentation's about <laughs> so you can make sure you wanna, you wanna spend your time listening. Um, again, it's the subject of this is street photography. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of street photography, not a lot, a little bit about my history in street photography so you can see where I'm coming from. And then some tips on technical things, uh, shooting ideas, um, ways to motivate yourself to do it, um, how to uh, stay safe while you're out on the streets. And, and I'm trying to cover everything I can think of a, that, that pertains to street photography that I do. I've led a lot of um, street photography walks uh, on my job with Panasonic. Part of the reason I'm doing this is um, in the past, well, before COVID, I used to travel. Every week I would travel somewhere with Panasonic. Uh, for a while, it was kind of nice. I would fly off and, and visit new cities or cities I've been to before. And in order, as I used to describe to people, to stay sane while I was traveling and not, and not end up in a, in a bar or restaurant all night long, I would take walks. I would take my camera. I'd get up early. I'd go out after I worked all day at a camera store or an event. I would get out and just walk and walk and walk with my camera. Um, so, anyways, let's start. Let's start with this picture here. This is um, this is an interesting picture of a woman that I met on the street for a, a while ago, a few years ago. I was doing a series of. Um, People who there's a lot of people, a lot of people in the world are tattooed, but a lot of people in Portland are tattooed. And um, a lot of people I noticed all of a sudden started putting phrases in their tattoos. And I would ask them what that meant and if I could photograph them. And I discovered, and this is something I discovered also with cowboys and train people, anything where people sort of decorate their body or wear a costume, they are more than glad to let you take their picture. Whenever I would ask somebody if I would meet them in a coffee shop or they would wait on me and I'd say, what's that mean? Can I take your picture? They'd say, yes. And, and it, would, it, would, it was the greatest experience. So let's start a little bit with the history uh, briefly here of, photog of, of street photography. I've loved street photography since I, I saw a book and I'm trying to remember it, Crisis uh, in United States um, in crisis in back in the 1960s about all the things that were going on in the United States in the 1960s in black and white. And I decided I wanted to become just a great street and news photographer. So just as far as history, this is a site I found that I really liked. And maybe Heather, can, uh, can, you, can you paste that into the um, uh, Heather or, or we can afterwards? Um, I like this because it listed the 20 most famous street photographers, so you can see quickly what they do. Um, and besides that, two of those people, one of them you see in the upper right there is Vivian Meyer, which most, most people have probably heard of by now. A few years ago, somebody bought um, a lot of, of thousands of negatives at an auction at a, um, what was it, a, um, like a, a mini storage warehouse sale. And Vivian Meyer's um, pictures she'd taken over the years were in there. And she was this prolific street photographer that nobody knew about. So if you're looking for something to watch, uh, look for the movie Finding Vivian Meyer if you haven't seen it. It's just amazing. And it explains a lot about why she and I and a lot of other people do street photography, which is not necessarily to get famous, but to record our world and, and, and sort of, um, um, you know, uh, give us something to do out there. Uh, another movie I really loved is Bill Cunningham, New York. Bill Cunningham was a photographer for the New Yorker or New York Times who rode his bike all around New York and until he died, almost until he died when he was, I think he was 88 years old, 
he would ride his bike around and do fashion photography for the New York Times. So they're all at this site here, this expertphotography.com uh, backslash famous street photographers. And why aren't I going to the next slide here? Oops, let's try that. Let's try that. There we go. <laughs> I love the way they change this program every time. Um, a few of my favorites I went through and a few pictures you, you might know from um, Joel Meyerwitz is uh, an American photographer who did street photography and and fashion. And um, he would worked as a professional photographer doing advertising photography too for in the 1960s and 70s. He still is around. He's still on Facebook. A lot of these people, if they're still alive, like Joel Meyerwitz, are on Facebook and Instagram. And you can see their most current pictures. Um, Robert, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. This is one of the most famous pictures ever taken. Um, a lot of people have probably seen this. It's been made into posters and books and just about everything. And there's been some questions over the years about whether he staged this. And this comes up with a lot of street photography, whether it's staged or maybe recreated. And I've actually done this myself. So that, that comes into play with a little bit of the not morality of it, but a little bit of the, the questioning of it. That's Bill Cunningham in the lower left, riding his bike around New York and shooting pictures of fashion. Um, I didn't want to leave out color, although most of the ones I like and most of the ones that you'll see online, especially the older ones are in black and white, but um, color, color plays a big part in street photography also. This is probably one of the most famous um, street photographs ever taken. This was at the end of World War II. I don't know whether it was VE or VJ day. Um, and Albert Eisenstadt took this in, uh, in New York of a sailor uh, kissing a woman. And this has been made into statues and everything. So, so street photography um, is, is, is this, pictures like this are what, what uh, got me excited about it. Um, so right now, for, so currently, so I love the past. I love looking at the pictures of the past and it can inspire me to do things like black and white or maybe more silhouette or things with water, things like that when I see pictures. But I really wanted to see what was going on now in street photography. So I did what I do when I want to learn everything else from refinishing a table to um, working on my deck. I did a YouTube or a Google search for street photography and it led me to all of these great people who were doing current um, videos about why they do street photography, the history of street photography, um, and, and anything you want to know about street photography. So anything that I leave out here, or if you're left thinking, gee, why didn't he talk about that? You can find it on YouTube. Okay. So me, so I've been doing street photography for 50 years. I, I've, I've stopped trying to hide my age since you can see me on Zoom, how old I am. Um, I started doing this as a teenager. I was, kind of a, I was kind of a shy kid and I didn't really know how to approach people. And my father bought me a camera when I was probably, I think about 12 or 13 years old. And he lived on Miami Beach and I would go over after school. I would take a bus to Miami Beach and I would wait for him to get off work. And while I was waiting for him, I would take my camera. He would give me a couple of rolls of film from, from the camera store that was right next to City Hall where he worked. And I would just walk the streets of Miami Beach. And this started me carrying a camera everywhere. I just became fascinated with people I saw on the street. And as a, as a teenager and kind of shy, I had no idea how to approach them. So um, I usually shot from a distance and I learned to shoot very quickly. Um, anyways, the picture on the left here um, of, of um, if, I don't know if everybody knows who he is, it's been a long time, that's former President Lyndon Johnson, who was extremely unpopular at the time. And this was taken during a Republican National Convention in 1968 in Miami Beach, when they allowed at the, at the time, the hippies, as they were called, to take over a park and um, basically protest the convention. The picture on the right is when I went to a um, three-day music festival back in the 1960s. And again, I just carried a camera everywhere. And the beauty of it in those days was that not everybody was carrying a camera like they are nowadays. And I could just take pictures without anybody giving it a second thought of how they were gonna look on Instagram or Facebook or anything like that. So I, I basically, as I said, started carrying a camera everywhere. And um, probably the only time I took time off from this is when uh, my son was growing up and um, I, I basically just couldn't carry a camera everywhere because you've got a kid to carry around with you or two or to keep an eye on. But um, when I started to work for Panasonic 
um, which was about 15 years ago. And they introduced the first small mirrorless cameras, well, even before that with cameras like the LX5 and the LX7, which were very small pocket cameras, um, point and shoot cameras with larger sensors. I just started carrying a camera with me everywhere again because of the small size. And uh, again, you'll see the camera down here at the bottom, which is one of my favorites. This is a GX9, it's called, but the GX85 is, is still one of my favorite cameras, mainly because of its size. Um, people wanna know if it takes a better picture. No, it doesn't. It's just a beautiful little size that I can kind of conceal in my hand. And a good example is this picture I took that you see the love written out, written in the bricks as the rain falls in this abandoned building. There was a lot of homeless people around here, just on the other side of the wall. When I looked on the other side of the wall, there were two or three people sleeping over there in a tent. And I didn't, I didn't feel necessarily afraid in that situation. This is Portland and it's, it's not like that. But the small camera doesn't make me conspicuous. Uh, if I was carrying my uh, a full frame camera or something with a larger lens, uh, I'm always worried that that person might be a little more tempted to ask what I'm doing. If I'm carrying a small camera, I can feel more like, like an amateur. I can come off more like just a guy who's walking around taking pictures. The picture on the right is a, is a reflection of me in a, uh, where was this, Atlanta, Georgia. So um, again, just one more slide about me. Um, I started again 50 years ago. This picture on the left was taken in Miami Beach in 1970. And this dog was actually, I, lo I love pictures like this. And this is, I'm going to talk a little bit about why you've got to be quick and why you've got to be ready. And I'm going to give you tips about how to do that. This, um, these people actually, the dog is actually leashed to the windshield wiper of the car to hold it there. And uh, I was walking along and the dog just looked at me and I raised my camera as quickly as I could. In those days, I was using obviously an SLR, a film camera, and I had to look through the viewfinder. Whereas now on an, in 19, in, I'm sorry, in the, in the year 2020, the picture I took in St. Paul, Oregon, I'm, this was at a rodeo and I saw these two guys talking and I was quite a ways away from them with a, a one to 300 millimeter Panasonic lens. And, uh, but again, I'm just, I'm using the LCD, which is nice. Not that these two would see me, but the, um, the mirrorless, the thing I love about mirrorless cameras and these small cameras is that they're quiet. They don't have a mirror in them to make that noise where either one of these guys would have been attracted to me. So to me, mirrorless cameras and LCDs have just been a boom to my, to my, um, my street photography. Okay, let's get into a little bit of the whys and hows. Okay, so I think the main thing that I like about street photography and I teach in my, um, my uh, photo walks when I take people out to talk about street photography is learning what I call learning to see more is uh, I, I became aware of this a few years ago. I was in uh, Bozeman, Montana. And if anybody's ever been to Bozeman, Montana, Yellowstone National Park is right nearby and everybody shoots nature. So I wanted to take people on a photo walk, just like I did for these two pictures in Seattle and Portland, Oregon. And in Bozeman, um, people came along to learn to use their camera, but a lot of them were like, well, gee, we wish you were doing this in Yellowstone. We wish you were doing this out in nature. And when we took the walk, the thing I stress when I take these photo walks and when I go on them myself is it's not the destination. I'm not headed somewhere. Even though I'm in Seattle, and this is, a, this is one, the, the one on the left where I was staying at a hotel, and I was actually going over to the Space Needle. That was my goal. But what I've learned is it really teaches me to see things that I used to miss when I'm walking to somewhere or I'm going somewhere. And in, it, it taught me, it's taught me to slow down. It's kind of like um, a little bit of a meditative or a Buddhist practice. It teaches me to slow down and just constantly be looking at the environment around me. And it turns out that those are the pictures I end up using, not the ones I take of the space needle at the end. The one on the right is interesting. Um, so, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how things have changed in street photography. Um, this was in Portland uh, last summer at the height of um, COVID and at the height of the um, George Floyd riots that took place here in, in Portland, the demonstrations. And I decided on weekends, I wanted to go down and see what was going on downtown, not during the demonstrations. 
Uh, I really, I really stress nowadays for people to stay away from things like that, because both sides can see you as the enemy in a situation like that these days where it used to be that you were just an observer. But anyway, so I went downtown Portland, and it was just deserted, there were homeless people sleeping on the sidewalks. But the art that the stores had put up uh, to block their, um, to block basically people from breaking their windows, or damaging their stores was just amazing. And so I walked around for quite a while taking pictures like this, um, like the one on the right here. So um, again, a new a, a way to see your city. And I use this constantly. So a year and a half ago when COVID first came along and I'd been traveling for five years, literally going to different cities, and, and all of a sudden Panasonic called one day and said, well, now you've got to work from home. And it kind of panicked me because I thought, gee, my own city, it's not, it's not that interesting. I know it well, what am I gonna do? I have nothing new to see. And what I started to do was try to find different ways to see this. One of them, and I learned this from uh, two customers at, uh, and I know um, uh, Heather's shaking your head right now, knowing who they are. There's two customers that I met at uh, Kenmore Camera who come in and they would come in and see me on a Saturday when I was at the store a few times a year. And what they would do, they were both uh, retired and they would pick a neighborhood in, in, in Seattle and they would just go there. It didn't matter what it was. They, they could pick any neighborhood from downtown to a small neighborhood to a few block area. And they would go wander around that part of town with their small, they, used, they both used Lumix cameras. They'd wander around that part of town for a few hours, drinking coffee and taking pictures. And again, the, the, the pictures they got, I follow them on Facebook, were just amazing. You're talking about so, John and Brett, right? Yes, John Brent. and Brett. It, it, Brent, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yes. They're we, like a wealth of neighborhood knowledge. Oh, they are. That's the thing too is, is I, thank you for mentioning that, Heather, because that's another thing that comes from it is, this knowledge of neighborhoods, and that's what I've learned too. So when COVID started, what I started to do was pick a neighborhood. Like in, in Portland, there's the Alberta neighborhood, there's the Mississippi neighborhood, um, there's the 23rd Street neighborhood. And even though I, sometimes I would think, oh my God, I'm out of interesting neighborhoods, I would just pick a neighborhood. And, and then what I started to do was um, go by coffee shops. So I would look up coffee shop reviews and I'd see a coffee shop that looked really good. And I'd go there and just wander around that part of town. Now I've branched out a little bit more where I'm going to small towns that are within, let's say about 30 to 45 minutes um, in every direction from Portland. And I just walk around those towns. And I, it lets it, like I said, it, I see things that I never would, would have seen driving through, obviously, or just stopping for coffee. So a good example, the picture on the left, I thought this was interesting. I was, this truck, I kind of like the colors of the truck, and I actually didn't notice till I got home that the door handle is a um, golf club, uh, the head of a golf club. Uh, and, and so just the things you see again by slowing down, the one on the right, was in the window of an antique store and the store was just jam-packed. The window was just jam-packed with antiques. And I just saw this, um, this, this fishing reel and zoomed in on it and, and took a picture and it's things that I just never would have seen. Um, this also brings up, and I didn't include a slide on it here, a concept I came up with that I think has saved me a lot of money during this, which is called photograph it, don't buy it and photograph it, don't eat it. And so a lot of times I would be tempted to go in and buy this, this reel because it looks so neat. Now I find that I'm satisfied just, just taking a picture of it. That also goes for the thing that saves me in these coffee shops is when they have great pastries is I'll just take a picture of it and post it on my Facebook page and say, photograph it, don't eat it. And I think it saved me a lot of calories and a lot of money in the meantime. Um, so travel photography. So this is where, again, this is, this is my favorite thing is because I would travel to all these different cities like Las Vegas on the left here and Seattle on the right. And, and because of my job, what would happen again, a lot of times when I first started doing this, you, know, you get off work at four or five in the afternoon or six o'clock. And the first thing you wanna do is um, maybe go have a beer or a glass of wine and then have dinner. And then all of a sudden it's bedtime. And I found that um, I just wasn't enjoying this. And I'm also a person who gets up early to walk. And so I wanted to get out. So I would just grab something real quick to eat and then hit the streets in Las Vegas 
basically just walking up and down the streets, going in and out of hotels um, for a combination of two things. One is to see new things in the photography gave me an excuse to go there. This is um, the one on the left is a hotel in Las Vegas, which I just love that sweep of that, um, the, the, the whatever they call the roof there. And the one on the right, I actually just took last um, Thursday in Seattle uh, when I was up to see uh, Heather at Kenmore. And this is down at the um, Wooden Boats downtown. And I'm going to talk about this in a few slides here of why I shoot black and white, why I want to vary different things and things you can do while you're out doing this. So we're talking about the why now, then we're going to talk about the how. So <laughs> staying sane, I actually, while I was looking this up, I've always realized this, but I was hesitant to put a slide in about this until I looked up the um, on YouTube, the current videos about um, um, why you do street photography. And one guy made a very good point, which just hits home with me, is especially this time of year, this is, this is, um, this is fall, and in, in this part of the country that Heather and I live in, it starts to get dark, and it starts to get wet. And it can be a little depressing. And if like me, you suffer from what's called seasonally affected disorder, where this type of weather really gets you down, um, street photography keeps me sane. Um, this is the season for street photography, just as spring is the season for leaves and fall is the season for, for, for leaves changing and spring is, again is the season for them coming back and summers for whatever national parks. Fall and winter are the season for street photography because the light is so dramatic, the clouds in the skies. And the, you, you don't want a lot of sun. You don't want a lot of contrast in these pictures. And so just, to, just for me to be able to, to go out, and actually the picture on the left is here in Portland. And this looks like it's in the evening, but this is about 5.30 at night um, in a, in a Jan, on a January evening. To, to show how dark it gets here so early. It can be this dark at 4.30 sometimes in the afternoon. Um, the one on the right is just from me walking around downtown and kind of showing some of the, um, oh, abstracts of the, of the changes that have taken place uh, here in Portland and in every other city during COVID. And that's something I like to document too, is the changes that have taken place. It's sort of an historical document. Um, this was actually, um, used to be a Korean church. And I don't know, for whatever reason, um, it, it closed down during COVID and people have spray painted the whole town um, and including the side of this church. So, so staying sane, again, it gives me something to do on a, on a rainy Saturday or rainy Sunday, um, or let's say even tomorrow night, I'm leading a photo walk with my photo meetup group, which I'm gonna talk about here in a minute, where we're meeting in a, in a part of town at 5.30 at night in, and we're just going to walk around and take pictures and then maybe stop for something to eat afterwards. Uh, it's a great way to, to spend time with people, give excuse to spend time with people and get out. Okay, let's talk about approaching people. <laughs> Most people will just say yes. Okay, this is, this is probably, I think, the hardest part about street photography is approaching people. It's what I have the hardest time with and what everybody I talk to has the hardest time with. And you can do street photography without approaching people to take their picture. The one on the left is one of the first ones I took about approaching people. And it's probably um, one of, the, one of the, the first one that amazed me, the guy said yes, because this was actually in a, this was, I took this while I was in high school and this was in, he was smoking in the bathroom. And I just walked in and said, wow, that looks great. Can I take your picture? And a lot of times, people, the next thing they'll say is, why do you want to take my picture? So in his case, he was a little suspicious that maybe I was going to show the, you know, the, the school authorities or something. And I said, no, I said, you just look great with that shirt, with the, the cigarette, your hair, the watch. Everything looks just great. And so what I do is flatter people. I always tell them why I'm taking the picture, why this looks so neat. I don't ever say, oh, I'm a professional photographer. I've seen people do this in my meetup groups. Oh, I'm a professional photographer. I'll give you the picture. I'll send it to you. Um, I don't do that. I actually um, try, to, try to act like I'm just an older man who is, this, thinks this looks really neat. Again, like the picture on the right of, um, I've, whoops, let me go back here. I've gotten to know this woman, Lydia. 
oops, and I've taken uh, several pictures. We, we've become friends and I've taken pictures of her and her tattoos over the years. When she became pregnant with her first child, she wanted me to take pictures of her pregnancy and pictures of her child when it was born. So it can lead to some interesting things. Um, the one on the bottom right was an interesting example. This was at a street festival in, uh, in downtown Portland that takes place in the summertime. And uh, this, this woman was having a really good time. I think she'd been, uh, I think, I don't think she was smoking cigarettes when she asked me for a light. And, and she just, it, I thought she just looked right there with her leg up. She's got a smile on her face that shows she's just a little bit in, in another dimension than the rest of us are. And I, I just said to her, I said, you look great. Can I take your picture? And if you do that, if you flatter people, um, they'll say yes. It, at least that's been most of my experience. Now, I've had a few times when it hasn't worked. One of them was, was one of my best photographic experiences, which is Muhammad Ali here on the, on the left. When I was walking the streets of Miami Beach, uh, I went into the Fifth Street gym where Muhammad Ali in the 1960s would, uh, would uh, train. And um, I walked up the stairs and there he was sparring with somebody else. And then he, then he was getting dressed and coming out. And I was just taking pictures of him. And this is him walking towards me. And I thought he was walking out of the building and he came over to me and he put his arm on my, his hand on my shoulder. And he, and he just said very nicely, he said, would you please stop taking pictures of me? <laughs> and, and I wouldn't trade that moment for anything in my life. Of course I said, yes, of course I'll stop taking pictures of you. Um, I was afraid he was gonna ask for the film, but he didn't, he probably would have if it would have been nowadays. But that was just a, a great beginning to somebody saying, don't take my picture. Now, the picture up here in the upper left, the deleted photo, the reason that says deleted is in, in 50, almost 50 years of doing this, the only time I've ever had anybody get mad at me was actually in Seattle. And I was actually shooting a picture of a building with about 50 people in front of it. And I just liked the way everybody was moving. And I wasn't paying attention to anybody in particular when a woman came out of the crowd down the stairs and she starts screaming at me, why are you taking my picture? Why are you taking my picture? I want you to delete that picture. Now, my policy is I'll always delete it. I don't, um, I'm not going to get in an argument with anybody. I'm not going to embarrass anybody online. But I asked her, I said, why? I said, I, I'm, you're not even, you weren't even my subject. I said, I'll show you the picture. You can hardly see yourself in it. Why did you want this deleted? And I thought it was interesting. She says, I'm smoking in that picture and my husband doesn't know I smoke. And I'm like, well, of course, but it's, you're so tiny in there, but it, again, I'll be glad to delete it for you and never put it online. And then the bottom right one is another one I used to my advantage. Um, this was actually years and years ago when I was in school and I asked this, I thought she was very pretty and I wanted to take a picture of her. And I asked her if I could take her picture and she put her hands over her face and said, no, no, no. And I took the picture and I actually think I got something that I like better than just a portrait of her looking at me. So anyways, I've never, the only time I've had a problem is with that, that one person. It wasn't really a problem once I explained it to her, but I've, I've, I've had people say no, that they just don't want their picture taken. And especially um, nowadays with, um, with social media, Facebook, YouTube, and those things, a lot of people are afraid their picture is going to get online. So whether you, what we're going to talk in a few minutes here about the technical side of it, but shooting people from a distance. So I frequently, I don't do this as much anymore as I did when I started. Um, when I first started, I used a, a 135 millimeter lens for everything. And I mainly used it because I wanted to catch people. And again, I was using a camera with a shutter that made a lot of noise and I'm looking through the viewfinder. So I'm obviously photographing them. And a lot of times they would see me or somebody else in the picture would see me and look at me. And so I would use the 135 millimeter lens to um, basically be inconspicuous, but it also helped throw the background out of focus like that and make the person stand out. Now, um, lately, this, this picture I took on the right was just by luck. I happened to be um, shooting in the um, tulip fields here in Portland, excuse me. And I was trying out a 100, 50 to 400 millimeter uh, Sigma lens on my Panasonic Lumix S5 when I saw this woman in the distance. And again, a lot of times I don't like to take pictures of people without them knowing it, or it, I don't want to feel like I'm eavesdropping or spying on people. 
But this one worked just perfect. If she would have seen me, she wouldn't have wanted me to take this picture. But when the dog looked over her shoulder, and then I don't know if you can see what her mask says, her mask says, we'll remove for champagne. And then the case on the phone, it was just perfect. So um, we're going to talk about equipment here in a minute and different lenses and things like that. So. so again, another one is to ask permission after you take the photo. So I love, this is, this again, this is a street festival that's here in uh, Portland on Alberta Street in the summertime. And it attracts just a lot of characters, just a lot of people who bring their dogs, they bring signs, they, they dress up. And what I do, and I'll, I'll talk about this more, my, the main thing I wanna stress here that is important to me is to shoot quickly, to learn to shoot quickly. That's why I love mirrorless cameras and I love small cameras like the Lumix cameras that I represent because I can walk along with this camera in the palm of my hand so I'm not looking conspicuous. And if I see a scene like this, I can quickly raise it up without looking into the viewfinder. I'm looking at the LCD on the back. I just touch the screen where I want it to focus on the dog and shoot the picture. Now, the woman on the right, after I took the picture, again, she thought I was taking a picture of the three women and she goes, she was nice about it, but she goes, why did, why did you take our picture? And it's, I like this now with, with, um, digital cameras is I can turn it around to her and I can say, look at this picture of the dog. Look at, that's what I'm photographing. And she smiles and she's just like, oh my God, that's a great photograph. Which leads me to one other thing is a lot of people I know who take street photographs when I go out with my meetup group will offer the people the photograph. They'll go, oh, do you, do you like the photograph? I'll send it to you. I used to do that, but I don't anymore just because it takes a lot of time and I have to stop and I have to get their email or I have to give them a business card and then I have to exchange emails with them. Um, it's only if they look at me and say, can I get a copy of that, that I'll give them my business card and say, you email me. I don't get their email and email to them. I say, you email me, tell me I took your picture with the dog on Alberta Street and I'll send them a copy of it. But um, again, I just really don't want to slow down. I just want to keep going, taking these pictures. Paying people, okay? So there's a lot of people on the street who do this for money. And like the guy on the, the left here, he is at the Portland uh, Saturday market that's downtown. He's been there for years. And this guy shows up every Saturday and Sunday and he plays harmonic, he plays guitar, he sings. Um, he's got a um, suitcase in front of him with money. And I'm if I'm gonna take his picture, I feel I'm gonna pay him. I'm obligated to pay this guy. So I'll throw a dollar in, the, in, in his suitcase. And what I'll usually get is if I give him a dollar or nowadays a couple of dollars with inflation, um, they will also, they'll pose for you. I can tell him to look to the side or look at me or he'll sing directly to me or, or stop if I want to. So, so, you know, and again, it's his way of making a living. Um, the guy on the right, this, this combines a lot of the things I've been talking about. So this is in Virginia City, Nevada. This is an old Western town here in the United States. One of these ones that's been somewhat preserved if you don't count uh, hot dog stores and antique stores. And this guy makes his living walking around town with this donkey dressed as an old miner and letting people take his picture. And so I walked out of um, this, this store that I'd been in and he was standing there and I asked if I could take his picture and he says, yes. And so I took two or three pictures and he was nice enough to say, you know, I do this, I do this for a living. And I'm like, oh, and that's so that that's my dollar in his hand that you can see in his left hand there. That's my dollar. And um, as I, I told somebody, I said, I, I learned a lesson here. So I knew that I liked the picture so much. I just love the photograph. And again, I'm using um, a small Panasonic Lumix. Uh, in this case, I think it was a GX8, which is a rangefinder style camera so that I can literally raise it up. I'm not looking through the viewfinder. So I'm, I'm looking directly at him. I'm having more contact with him. I raise it up, I touch the screen to focus it on his face and I fire off two or three pictures just to make sure I've got it. Well, at that point, he, he said, you know, I do this for a living and I gave him a dollar. And then I said, if I give you another dollar, can I take a few more pictures? And, and he said, of course. So I gave him more money and took a few more pictures. And then I liked the picture so much. And I, I've done this twice now in my life. I made the mistake of giving him a $5 tip. And the trouble with that was 
every store I, I came out of when I was in town, he was there waiting for me because he thought I was going to give him more money. And I actually did this once on a photo walk here in Portland. We were um, downtown and there was a group of, um, oh, I guess, I, I guess they were homeless, but they were having a good time. They were young kids and they were kind of having a good time. And I, I was with, I was leading a photo group and I said, is there any chance um, if I pay you $5, you'll, um, you'll let us all take your picture, the whole photo group photograph. And they were just terribly excited about it. But then they followed us and wanted more. No, I don't mean more money in the sense they were trying to rob us, but they were like, well, post for you doing this. We'll do anything you want if you'll give us another $5. And so uh, be careful, pay them what, pay them what they, they, they normally get and then, and then move on. But, um, but anyways, feel free to, that these people will pose for you, this, this guy. Um, and then, you know, I get to talking to him and he tells me his life story. So street photography in 2021, things have changed a lot, not only due to COVID, but due to at least, you know, a lot of people from other countries here in the United States, and I suspect in other countries. Um, here in Portland right now, we have a pretty bad homeless problem. Um, and it's changed over the years. It used to be I found even five years ago that if I photographed a homeless person, they they would just they would either ask you for money a dollar or so, not try to shake you down or rob you, but but ask you for a dollar. But now there's a danger involved in it. Now um, I've heard of people who who where they they'll want your camera. All of a sudden now you're in a dangerous position. The people who are out there and who are homeless, at least in Portland, there's a more dangerous aspect to them. So um, I don't get involved with that. Um, I was out with my photo meetup group a while ago, and one of the one of the guys in my group was taking pictures of a homeless person who started coming at us and saying, "You can't take my picture." Uh, and oops, let me turn my phone off here. And uh, the um, I'm sorry, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't Heather. Uh, the guy I was with starts yelling at him, "I have a right to take your picture." <laughs> And, and I pointed out to him that this guy doesn't care about his rights. And so just be careful out there. I'm going to talk a little bit about what to do about that. So what I do now is, again, I'll pick a neighborhood to take a walk. This is something I've been doing since COVID, since I was going out alone, then decided it wasn't that safe sometimes. I have a group of four photographer friends, and we will pick a neighborhood and take a walk together. We'll meet for coffee if it's in the morning and then go from there or we'll take a walk in the afternoon and then have a beer at the end of it. But again, we'll just pick a neighborhood. But again, even though we're all a little older, I feel like there's safety in numbers, um, that, that nobody's going to bother us if, if there's a, a group of four of us. And if there's a group of four of us, somebody will probably spot that maybe we've walked into the wrong neighborhood. You know, Maybe we've gone too far down here or something like that. So that's one thing to do is find a friend. And, and again, just pick a neighborhood. Just pick wherever you are. Um, I don't know if, um, again, a lot of people from other countries here, photo meetups are very popular in the United States, um, meetup.com, and I love this. So I joined the local Portland photography one here um, 13 years ago. And like I said, tomorrow night, what we're doing is uh, I've organized a meetup where we're going to meet in a part of town. There's 13 of us coming. And People can either split up or go together in small groups. And then what we do is at the end, we decide on some place that we're going to meet. And it also gives you, uh, meetup.com gives you a place to post pictures from the meetup. It gives me a place to organize those meetups, to post it and, um, and, and invite people to it. And again, an album too. And then we can also do... Um, uh, Zoom meetings and things like that on it. So I don't know if they're worldwide or not, but it's meetup.com. And they also, they don't only just have photo groups. I belong to a kayaking group. Um, uh, I belong to, I can't remember, a, a meditation group. It's just, I think it's just the greatest thing for meeting like-minded people who do what you do. Okay, so let's talk about equipment for a while, or just for a few slides here. And I always hate that term, a while. Uh, so keep it simple. Again, I, I strongly stress that you don't go out there with your big full frame camera and your 70 to 200 millimeter 2.8 lens. Two things, one is you're, you're just a target. And what I find is it slows me down. It discourages me from doing it. I'll think, oh, do I really wanna go up another block or two? This camera is heavy. And the light camera, 
it makes it too so and also don't have to feel there's the importance on where I'm going. I can just be taking a walk and with a small light camera. Um, if I don't get any pictures, I don't mind. What I suggest is taking one lens, two at the most. The reason for this is, is again, just, just don't wear a backpack. Um, I try to keep it down to something that I won't mind. I wouldn't say mind losing, but if I lose, it won't, it won't break my heart. Like the camera on the left here at the bottom, the Panasonic Lumix G95 and the LX100 on the right, which are my, my two sort of um, go-to cameras these days. Um, I mean, they're not cheap, but they're both uh, around seven or $800. That's a lot better than, than losing my um, $3,000 Lumix S5 with its uh, 24 to 70 millimeter lens. And again, the pictures I got, I don't think there's gonna be that much difference unless it's in a low light situation. Don't act like a photographer. Don't, um, I, I will frequently, if, so, if like in the cases where I've asked somebody if I can take their picture, I will actually act like I'm a little bit of a not sure about how to use my camera. Um, it's, there's no, you're not trying to impress anybody out here. If you look like a photographer, I think they're gonna be more apt to um, try to get money from you or do something like that. I just say, hey, I'm just out taking pictures. Can I do this? And if they ask where I'm going to use them, I just say on, on social media so they know. Now, I really love a, um, I, I love a touch screen, but most cameras have touch screens nowadays. But I really love the, um, the articulating or the swivel LCD screen that you see on the Lumix G95 here. Um, the reason I love that, it lets me be less conspicuous. It lets me get higher and lower with the camera. And it also lets me shoot sideways sometimes. If I see something going on over to the side of me, I can hold the camera one way and still have the um, LCD twisted and touch the screen to focus it and shoot the picture. And I can even shoot the picture from the screen, but I use the shutter button. And also all of these, um, all Panasonic cameras, and I think most other cameras have what's called a silent mode these days. And so I can put the camera completely in the silent mode, although I find these um, mirrorless cameras are, are so quiet that I don't really worry about that anyways. Okay. Lens choices. Um, I, I, I prefer wide angle. I prefer my two favorite lenses are the Lumix 7 to 14 or the 8 to 18. The picture on the uh, right here of Las Vegas is with the 7 to 14. And I just love that sweeping feeling and a little bit of distortion that it gives the picture. But again, take out whatever, take out whatever lens you want. Um, a photo walk I took a couple of weeks ago, I brought my um, 7 to 14 millimeter lens. And all of a sudden I wanted to photograph something in the distance. And a woman who had come on the walk brought a one to 300 millimeter lens and just loaned it to me. And so we switched, but I don't ever like to carry more than two lenses. Again, just for the weight, the size, um, you know, the idea that it, what if I do get robbed and I just lose one camera, one lens. Um, but, but another thing I like, and I find that, that I see this a lot in my photo meetup group, they'll bring a backpack full of lenses because they're afraid they're gonna miss something. What I tell them is then come back to this neighborhood next week with the 70 to 300 or the one to 300. This time bring the zoom. Again, it's that it lets me view things differently if I view it with a wide angle or a telephoto uh, or even a macro. If I bring a macro and realize that this, this lets me see small things that I'm looking for out there like these bottles over here in the upper left. Um, if I've got a macro, I feel that I'm looking for things that are close. But again, these were in a these were in the window of a uh, uh, of an, another antique shop, and if you if you want to shoot, and I think most people probably know this, but if you shoot in a window, make sure you press your lens right against the glass so that you can eliminate any reflection. Um, the bottom left picture here, the Hollywood Theater. This is an odd lens I bought. This is a um, two hundred dollar lens I bought for my full frame camera. That's eleven millimeters, and it actually distorts. It's a little bit of a fisheye. And so I'll go out with a lens like that, even though a lot of times I'll go out and think, oh my God, I wish I would have brought this lens or that lens. I can always go back with it. You can always go back to these neighborhoods. It gives you an excuse. Yeah. So camera settings. Okay, so the main thing, if you take anything out of this, <laughs> out, of this out of this talk, is to learn to shoot quickly, practice shooting quickly. These are two good examples. So what I do is I keep my camera when I'm walking around in the intelligent auto mode which on a Panasonic camera does everything for you. Now, most every camera has some sort of program mode or intelligent auto mode. 
But what this means is that when I raise the camera up and I look at that LCD and I push the button, the camera is going to get the focus, the camera is going to get the exposure. Maybe it's not the depth of field I want, maybe it's not the aperture and shutter speed I want, but it's going to get the picture. A good example was I was taking a, um, a photo group on a walk here in Portland a few years ago. And we were starting out in this rest, this is a, through the window of a restaurant, the picture on the bottom left. I touched the camera to the glass and the guy just looked up at me and made this face. I very quickly pressed my camera to the window, pushed the shutter button. Luckily, the guy in the back was laughing. This guy was just perfect. And it's all an intelligent auto. So I really stress, I know people look at me like I'm crazy when I say use the auto mode, but I wouldn't have gotten that picture if I would have been in um, aperture shutter or um, the, my least favorite mode, which is manual for shooting on the street, just because of how slow it takes. Another good one again, and I didn't press against the window in this one, I was in Bozeman, Montana, um, walking around one night, again, seeing a new city. And I, all I saw when I walked by was the sorry we're open sign, which I thought was just great. It's a famous restaurant in Bozeman. And I'm sitting there and I'm actually staring so much at the sorry we're open sign that these people had been making these faces at me and holding their hands up and trying to get my attention for probably 10 seconds before I saw them. But again, I, even though I'm at night, I'm in the intelligent auto mode, I'm holding the camera out, I'm looking at the LCD and I'm just firing away and I don't miss that picture, okay? Um, so again, let's talk about camera settings a little bit. Intelligent Auto or Program, if that's what your camera has in it, because Program also does everything, but it does let you override some things like Aperture, which can be nice. Um, if I do, if, if you really don't wanna use the auto mode or you have time, I use the shutter priority mode because the main thing I want is to make sure the movement is stopped. I, I would like to also have shallow depth of field or sometimes more long, you know, more depth of field. But my main concern is my, I'm move, if I'm moving the camera or the subject is moving, I've got a high shutter speed. So I'll use shutter priority sometimes. And if I can, a shutter speed of around a 500th of a second to be sure. Um, I always use auto ISO. Oops, let me go back to, I always use ISO, auto ISO because, and I'll stop that. <laughs> um, I know as the ISO goes up, the picture gets noisier, but I want the picture irregardless of noise. And I'll talk about these, these two pictures down here at the bottom. And the, these pictures encompass all of these things, learning to use the LCD screen to compose quickly. So again, this is this Alberta Street Festival that I shoot just tons of pictures at in the summer, the one here with the guy with the giant bubble. Now I saw that bubble coming and I was is actually shooting the bubble when I saw this guy's reaction to it as, it as it came towards him. And this is a good use of using the LCD screen, but um, in this one, again, I'm using, I'm using full intelligent auto. The camera is gonna pick a good shutter speed. It's gonna get a, pick a good aperture. And if I'm using a camera with a small sensor like the G series or one of our point and shoot cameras, a Lumix, I'm gonna get a lot of depth of field. Whereas with full frame, the people in the bubble back there would have been out of focus. Now I'm getting everything showing the whole street festival. Um, I think one of my favorite examples is the one on the far left. So I took this on a New Jersey transit subway. And if I don't know if anybody here is from New York, you've been to New York, but you know about New York. People don't like necessarily having somebody take their picture in the subway like this. So this is where the conductor comes along and punches the ticket. These guys were probably about four feet from me. So I'm using a Panasonic Lumix LX10 with a LCD touchscreen. And what I do is I don't even look at the camera. I don't even look through it. I raise it up to about chest level as fast as I can and snap the shutter button and then put it back down. And then if they haven't noticed me, I do it again. And I, I, I do it as quick as possible so they don't see me because in a lot of situations like there, there's a good chance one of them is going to question me or who are you or what are you doing or things like that. And anyways, I get a picture like this. Maybe I would have wanted something else in the background if I had time, but I, I just really like the picture. Color black and white. So um, I think street photography works great in black and white. Obviously, I think a lot of people know that your camera can be set to a black and white mode if you have a mirrorless camera. You can set it to view it in black and white, which I like. 
Um, so that way, when I'm walking down the street, I can see it. You can also set it in different formats, like square or four to three, if you want to um, emulate older older camera styles. So again, this these pictures incorporate a lot of what I was talking about. So this picture, the keep it clean. This is sort of an historical picture. This has to do here in Portland with uh, COVID and keeping things clean. And again, a store put this up to keep the demonstrators, to keep people from breaking their window. They tried to do interesting things and they were they made for great photographs. The articulating um, screen, which you see again on the Lumix G95 there on the, down there at the bottom, let me get this dog picture. So I was at, this was actually um, at a street festival and I saw this dog and I wanted to take its picture. And again, what I do is a lot of times I shoot and then ask permission. So I lower the camera, I, are, I point that screen up at me so I can see it. And that I'm down at that dog's level without having to get down at that dog's level. <laughs> and then the people turn to me and, and, and I can see that. And I said, oh God, you, you, you just, it's just a great looking dog. Can I take his picture? And again, if you do that and you don't say, you know, I'll see a lot of photographers go, let me show you the picture. This is great. I don't care about that. It's just like, I, I want the picture. So I'll compliment the dog and the owner of the dog is going to look at you and go, oh, wow. Well, thank you. I, I you know, I'm glad, I'm glad you like them. And, and you've got the picture and you're gone. Early or late, best times to photograph. The picture on the left in Las Vegas was taken as the sun was rising on these buildings. And this was obviously done. This was obviously retouched a little bit in the computer, but I'm up at, I'm up at sunrise if I can, if I'm visiting a city because that and um, dusk are the best times to shoot. The picture on the right is the Space Needle in Seattle. Again, one of the best things about this area is that it gets dark early. And one of the worst things about this area is that it gets dark early in the winter. But you can be out shooting pictures like this at six o'clock at night in, in, in Seattle in the wintertime. Processing images. So a lot of times when I'm out shooting, I will actually use the Wi-Fi feature in my camera, which again, most cameras have that allow you to connect to your Android or Apple cell phone and transfer the picture right over to your phone and adjust it. I use, I use the free app Snapseed. If you haven't tried it, it's just amazing for, you can crop, you can do contrast, you can convert it to black and white, you can do HDR. Um, it's just amazing for doing things on the go. Uh, if I'm going to do it at home, I tend to use uh, Adobe Lightroom and the DxO Nick collection to do my black and whites. Nick, Nick collection in, uh, if, is made by a company called DxO, and it has a great set of black and white conversion um, filters in it for making it a lot easier for you. And again, so we're almost at the end here. So street photography has also influenced all of my other photography, mainly by teaching me to shoot very quickly and pay attention to what's going on around me, constantly looking around. The picture on the left, I have to put it in is my son and my granddaughter. And um, she doesn't like to have her picture taken. And we were having lunch and she was getting tired and she grabbed onto his arm. And I had my Lumix LX10 with me. And again, from what I've learned through street photography, I very quickly raised the camera, briefly looked at the screen and pushed the shutter two or three times. And then it gave her time to go, don't take my picture, but I'd already gotten it. And my son looking at me like, isn't this, isn't this great? The one on the right um, is uh, two people I met at a party and I was shooting pictures at this birthday party. And again, I was ready. I was shooting a picture of a little girl when her mother looked around the corner and looked at me and just smiled. And instead of saying, oh, could you hold that pose? I just touched the screen to focus on the girl hit the shutter button. And so learning to shoot quickly, learning, learning street photography, practicing it. I look at it as my, I'm like, like a piano player who practices every day. This gives me a, a, a chance to practice my photography every day and it's paid off in all my other photography. Um, uh, we're getting near the end here, I'll make it quick. So focus modes, I only use two different focus modes. I use the autofocus single uh, mode, which is a single point. That's when I can touch the screen and put that point anywhere I want. But mainly, again, I leave the camera. When I'm in the intelligent auto mode, the camera is automatically in the 225 area, or if you've got a different camera, it could be 50 area. And it's going to decide where to focus. And it usually focuses on the, the, the subject that's closest to you. So again, if I'm doing street photography, it'll focus on that person, uh, whatever it is that, that's right in front of me. I don't do things like autofocus tracking. 
I don't necessarily do face detection. Again, the 225 area or the on your camera, whatever the, the multi-area uh, automatic mode um, will cover just about everything. Um, we're down to almost the end here, experiment. So uh, if you have a older camera and you're thinking about buying a new, hopefully Panasonic Lumix camera, I had one of my old cameras converted to infrared. I had a Panasonic Lumix GX7, which I, I, I love this camera and I didn't want to let it go, but new cameras with better sensors had come along. So I had it sent to, um, in, in, in Seattle, and Ken Moore can do this for you, to lifepixel.com and had them convert it to infrared. So it becomes, it becomes uh, permanently converted to infrared. But again, here's a picture. Uh, the picture on the left is in Colorado when I was staying at a hotel. And this would have been a pretty picture of the mountains back there, but it wasn't particularly exciting. But infrared makes it a lot more dramatic and turns, as you can see, all of the trees white, but, but gives you anywhere there's blue in the sky, it almost goes black. Uh, the one on the right was taken again at the, um, the boat center in Seattle. And it just gave it a, in color, this picture was really dull. It wasn't even a good tourist picture. Uh, I'm not saying it is here, but I like it. And it just, it just really brought life to the picture. Anyways, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Um, thank you for attending. If you want to see my pictures, I don't have a website. The best place to see them is on Instagram and Facebook. And I just go by the name Mark Toll. If you have any questions that we're not, we can't answer here or you have to go, uh, feel free to email me at marktollphotography at gmail.com. Right. Thank you. Mark, that was awesome. Um, we do have some questions. Um, there was a lot of discussion about um, releases, model releases, um, when you're out there doing street photography. I don't know if you're yeah. up on all the right. Yeah, I do. Yes. And, and the other one too, I see they're about photographing children. So I never photograph children because um, I just don't. Nowadays, you, you, it's, just, uh, it's just taboo. Um, I'll photograph a child if they're a part of a scene or something like that, but not directly. And if I do, I always ask their parents and I hardly ever put it on social media. Now, as far as I get a lot of questions about the legality of it, like showing these pictures here. Now, the law is, and I know there's a lot of interpretation of it, is that if you use the picture to make profit from, then it's a problem. Then you have to have a release. So if I were to take one of those street pictures and use it as a part of an ad, let's say for Panasonic or for Kenmore camera, then it would yes. be a problem because that person would have rights to their image and to money from it. But if I'm just putting these on social media, I don't worry about it. If, if you know, a lot of times I'll ask the person or things like that. And I'll be honest with you, the chance of them ever seeing it are slim. I never put up a picture that's, of a, uh, that's embarrassing of a person. I just don't believe in that. So I'm hoping that if the person does see it um, and it's, they're, not, they're not in a compromising position, they're not in a place they shouldn't be, they're not in a bar when maybe they shouldn't be. Um, and, and my feeling is if they ask me, if they were to see it and ask me to take it down, I would take it down. Um, I would have no qualms about it. And again, my understanding and feeling is, is that it's just about whether you make money with that picture. If I were to sell it to a magazine or um, I understand I could sell it in a gallery uh, without a problem. But if I were to use it at somewhere, let's say Panasonic made a profit from it, then you can't do it. You have to have permission. Um, right. see, somebody asked if I have a project in mind. Um, and I, I do. Yes, I still, I, I have this project in mind with the, uh, the, the tattoos that have phrases in them that I hope to get back to now that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working more at home and not, uh, not traveling so much. That would be fun. Yeah. I think no, it's it, always good to like, you know, either have a project or go out, you know, with sort of like a, not a theme, but an idea just to sort of force yourself to, you know, find certain things or yeah. shoot certain things. So you're just not like wandering around aimlessly. <laughs> exactly. Know? Every well, once I, in a while, challenge yourself, you know, have yeah. a little photo challenge with yourself. Well, and then I've actually, I've stumbled into a project where what I've done is I volunteer now to, um, with a group that cleans up Portland. Um, they're, oh, called yeah. Sol, they're called Solve. And so I go down and basically we get bags and we pick up trash because the city needs a lot of cleanup. And they saw that I was a photographer by seeing photography in my email name. And they said, would you take pictures of us doing this? 
So now I've kind of turned my street photography into this project to record what Solve is doing cleaning up Portland yeah. uh, from when we start to when we finish. Yeah. You should be posting that on social media so people can join. You know, people might not know about it. I, I never heard of it. Yeah, no, I've, and every city has one. And uh, anyways, it's, uh, but uh, now they want me to do video. They're like, oh, could you do more? <laughs> could you do more for us? <laughs> could, you, could you do our staff portraits and stuff like that? So, you opened a little, uh, yeah. Little- and that's, box. <laughs> yes. Somebody asks, so if we do follow you, do we get a follow back? Uh, yes, you do. Yes. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I mean, and I've, I've, my criteria, and I don't know what other people's is, is for following somebody back on in, Instagram and Facebook is if they have pictures, you know, yeah. um, it, it, at my age, when I get a request from a young woman who, who only has self-portraits or three pictures on, I'm not going to follow her back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but if I see, if I see that you're a photographer, I would love to follow you and see what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody's asking about taking bird nest pictures of bird nests. So, um, um, let me scroll you, down a little bit there. Uh, how about taking bird nest? Huh? I don't yeah. know about that. Uh, we get sure. a copy of the recording. So, uh, yeah, you can email here. Let me put this in the chat if you would like a copy. Did you put the email in for them? Yeah. Yes. If you want to keep going with the questions there, I'm going to take yeah. this in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, somebody said children are people like adults. Um, I guess so, but you know, I've got two granddaughters now, and and it's funny. I don't like a lot of pictures of them on social media, you know, or being used. I just maybe I've read too many news stories about somebody seeing something or spot. You know, I just I don't know. I'm just I'm just hesitant. I find, uh, you know, one one of the, I forgot about one other situation where I was actually shooting. Um, um, you'll, you'll be surprised at this, Heather. I was shooting a landscape. <laughs> I know. I, shooting a I, was at the, I was at the river near my house and I was shooting a landscape and there was a lot of people at the shore and rafts out on the river. It was just a really neat day. And I'm shooting pictures of the whole scene and this woman just starts screaming at me not to take pictures of her child. Oh, wow. And, and so I just told, I'm, you can, do, you know, you, everybody can obviously do what they want and maybe in different countries, it's different, but I just, and I guess, I think it's because of my granddaughters. I just don't know if I want their, their faces out there and I want to respect yeah. other people's. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. Well, it's funny because everybody's out there with their phone now and nobody seems to have any issue with having a phone pointed at them, exactly. you know? I mean, maybe some people do, but it just feels like everybody around you is just constantly documenting everything that's going oh, on. And you're just oh, yeah. kind of like, and then putting it on Facebook and Instagram, but I don't want to be the one. Yeah. yeah. And again, yeah. You know, I didn't bring up the phone, you know, I mean, I'll use my phone for some pictures, but the thing about the phone I find limiting is that is its lenses. You know, it's usually only a wide angle to a slight telephoto. Mm-hmm. And I just want my camera to be able to sometimes zoom further or get wider, something that's a different look. And another thing you too can, is- You can do this, Mark. You can uh, zoom in that way. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, uh, but I still, I'm old enough. I like the quality. When I zoom in, I lose some of that. But, yeah. but the other thing too is, you know, I realize, I mean, I have an iPhone, what is it? 11 or something like that. I'm holding an $1,100 phone. <laughs> Yeah. And, and yeah. actually, you know, if somebody's nowadays, because cameras are getting to be, you know, not quite as common on the street as we know, mm-hmm. uh, I think somebody's more apt to want to steal your phone than your camera. <laughs> you know, yeah. so anyways, I just, yeah. I, it, maybe it's just because I'm older that I still like using a camera. Um, yeah. Yeah. So did you go to Woodstock? Uh, no. Somebody no. was asking. No, the, <laughs> the pictures were from, uh, after Woodstock, that picture of the concert was at the Palm Beach Rock Festival. Right. <laughs> I, right. I lived in Miami, Florida, but no, unfortunately, I didn't get to go to Woodstock. I did get I, living in Miami. I did get to go to a lot of great things like Democratic and Republican conventions and demonstrations and things like mm-hmm. that. And I was in Washington D.C. once when I was about seventeen, taking street photographs. When a um, policeman tapped me on the shoulder and said, "Do you want to be arrested?" And I said. No, why? And he goes, oh, well, if you want to be arrested, you stand on that side of the rope. And if you want to, don't want to be, you stand on this side of the rope. You're on the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, this is, this is very know. organized. <laughs> I said, you really? Know. He goes, yeah, it's all set up. Don't worry. You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> they, they will bring buses up. And if you want to go, you can go, you know. And the, Wow. That's funny. Yeah. But I've, I've, um, been, I've been lucky enough to be in, an, I don't know, just a lot of different places. So. Yeah. Miami is probably very, I think it's very interesting. So um, 
Somebody's wanting to know if you ask permission to use photos after you've taken them, no. if someone's face is in them. Okay. No, I don't. And again, okay. I, I don't do something where, I, I, if you look at my Facebook, I, nobody's, I'm not embarrassing anybody. And I think that goes back to my days. I was a uh, portrait and event photographer for a long time. And I'd be, shoot a lot of corporate events. And somebody would always mm -hmm. say, don't, look, don't make me look bad. And I'm like, they're paying me to make you look good. <laughs> you know, they're not, I'm not here to embarrass you. And so uh, I think that's just come through. I, it's too, it's too easy to go for that tricky picture of somebody doing falling down or, or, you know, or whatever, you know? Yeah. But I just yeah. don't like, you know? Yeah. Let's see here. What else do we have? And most of these are just regarding taking pictures of people and. Um, oh, another, another one too, just is another one that I got. Uh, somebody's talking about projects. A few years ago, I kind of stumbled into a, um, a train, um, what do you call it? Not a museum, but a place where they repaired steam trains here in Portland. And, mm. I, and I took oh. some pictures um, just wandering around. And as a way to, this is another thing to do, as a way to say thanks, I met the guy there and he gave me his card. And I sent him some pictures and I said, thank you very much for letting me take pictures. Here's a few, if you have any use for them, right? Mm -hmm. And he contacted me and he said, our photographer just moved out of the area. Would you be our photographer? You know, mm -hmm. it's a volunteer position, but mm -hmm. he goes, you know, he goes, whenever we're doing some repair on the steam train and it's closed to the public, we'll invite you down. And I've oh, got nice. the most amazing pictures of steam trains. Yeah, yeah. That's a so good it, kind of little little tip for people who have trains in the area you can yeah. go down so, well, there you know, that's that's one situation where if you can send the if it is a situation you can send the picture to them it might do you some good it might lead you to something you know i've done it with i've shot a lot of rodeos that's not exactly street photography i do a lot of western and rodeo stuff and again i'll give those people my card sometimes because they love having their picture taken because they're in mm -hmm. costume Right. Yeah. And they contacted me and I've gone to their ranches and um, I've gone on brandings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, 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 it can open lots of doors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, a couple people are asking about recordings or slides. We don't have slides to give out afterwards, but you can um, request a recording and then you can watch the slides through there but well, i like you know. somebody somebody's question here is if you ever had to prove that you're a, you are a photographer and again no I, I actually try to keep it i actually try to keep it under wraps it's like i don't want to be a photographer in this situation you know uh, yeah you know yeah i'm not out there to to to, to you know uh, prove anything to anybody yeah yeah and i don't know if you've ever had to like get a release from somebody while you're shooting on the street on the go no, I, do you if i did i wouldn't to be honest with you i wouldn't take the picture i'm too lazy yeah <laughs> i mean i imagine probably now there's some kind of app or something that you can have yeah. people pull it out on your phone and be like okay hit agree <laughs> or something like that so um, tom, i like tom's question here tom i miss the panasonic drink and click event in northern california yeah. so, so do i tom <laughs> i know we miss all the drink and clicks oh we my do. gosh we do so much fun all the live and, events yes all the live events someday we will be back exactly. there um how important are candid photos to you mark uh yeah a lot i mean i think these are mostly candid i like candid um yeah. you know i'm and, and again probably part of it is i i was a shy kid and i was afraid to ask people to pose and then for a long time i shot professionally and i had to ask people to pose Mm. and and now i kind of like going back to the candid you know yeah that's somebody had mentioned in the chat that you know once you ask somebody to you know if you can take their picture their whole demeanor just changes and oh, so they yeah. turn into posing and you know well, they're like okay what do you want me to do well, it's like that one of my uh, my son with his his uh, daughter, daughter yeah. on his arm. i mean that picture was gone you know, I, I literally, I always take, I always mm -hmm. hit the shutter button two or three times just to be sure. Mm -hmm. And by the third time it was gone. She was like, I don't, I don't yeah. want you to take my picture. <laughs> for, for no reason, except the fact she's I know. Years old. It's, you know? it's having their own aut aut autonomy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. When they learn, they can say no <laughs> to Somebody adults. Asked, wouldn't Panasonic require leases if you have people in the photos? Yes, they would. But um, if mostly if it's in print, if we were using it in print with that yeah. camera, Right. I don't worry about it in presentations like this because this is more of an informative. It's not, we're not, uh, you're not paying for this. If you were paying for this, it would be different. I'd probably have yeah. to be more careful about the pictures I used. Yeah. But this, 
I, if you use pictures in a teaching situation like this is, then it's not a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And usually what happens too, that is if you get called on this by somebody, if somebody questions you about it or finds out you use their picture, usually if you take the picture down from where it is, and I make sure it's always electronic, not in print. Mm -hmm. If you take it down, it, sol it solves the problem. Mm -hmm. What about yeah. taking pictures of homeless people? Somebody asked. I don't like to personally. I think it's an invasion of their problem, part of privacy. I think these people don't have much going on in their life and um, they're having a hard time. Uh, one thing my, my this is actually my um, sister-in-law did this. She was photographing homeless people in Reno, Nevada. And she would talk to them on the street and photograph them. And then what she decided to do was actually go to the shelter and set up her studio and take formal portraits of them that they could have for... Mm -hmm their family or if they wanted to use them for anything and sort of treat them with dignity. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times I feel like I'm, I'm stealing their image. You know, I'm using their image. Right. Yeah. These poor people. Exploiting so, them in some way. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. So personally, I don't, yeah, I don't like doing it. You know? Yeah. I don't think I would either. Yeah. It makes me feel yeah. strange. Um, if anybody has questions, please put them in the Q and a now because we are almost done here. Somebody did um, one more. What did you plan to do with the picture you took of the child before her mother noticed you? Well, I, I had treated it as this whole landscape and I was going to probably put it on, all my pictures go on Facebook and Instagram. I don't know what else I do with them these days. I print some for the walls, but um, um, so, you know, I probably would have put it on Instagram and Facebook, but again, the, the people were just a small part of the picture. You know, you never mm -hmm. would have you never would have been able to identify a face. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I think if you're clearly identified, yes. identifiable, then then you have to worry a little bit. But one more real um, quick, if you don't mind, I know we're running over. When somebody said you take short video clips, and I don't know if they're referring to the 4K photo mode in the Panasonic cameras, where you can take a short video and pull a frame out of it. Mm -hmm. I've done that a few times in situations um where things might be moving around a lot stuff like that you know but but not that often no they're mm -hmm. mostly they're mostly all stills right yeah okay so somebody oh, sorry sorry we ran over i didn't no you're fine you're fine yeah, well we lost a few people i know some people are on it on the schedule not like back to back book there <laughs> <laughs> anyways well thank you thank you all for uh for... Well, we do have one more question oh i'm sorry um so printing books, cards um, with your street photos is okay not to have a release by selling an image to an ad. Yeah, again, if I was if yeah. I was the if I was the level of photographer that I sold that book on Amazon or in a bookstore or something, then I wouldn't do it if I had a, unless I had a release. But if I was going to make, let's say, a blurb book or something like that, you know, an online Just giving book, to your friends or yeah, give to my or... friends or you know, mm -hmm. that, that type of thing. I would give it away. It's okay. But if I you sell it. Yeah. Then... And to me, and I know there's a lot of nuances to the law. I look at it all as if it's something I'm making a profit of, then I've got to have a release. Yes. And if it's yes. not, then I, I'm hoping I can throw myself on the mercy of the court. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Use discretion while out there. Exactly. Um, someone else had uh, also asked about your favorite times to shoot, do straight photography or do a meetup. Um, oh, morning and morning or evening. So uh, my meetups, um, especially again, this time of year when the days are getting shorter, yeah. I schedule them to start at, I'd like to start at seven or eight, but people like mm -hmm. to tend to start at nine, <laughs> but I just get there early. Or I, uh, my favorite time this time of year is late afternoon when it's the sun, the light, uh, the sun starts to go down in, at a different angle. And I'm out there at four or five o'clock, you know, right. depending on when. Yeah. But again, this time of year, especially in, in our part of the world, Heather, it's pretty cloudy during the day. Yeah, it's but, pretty, uh, it's getting there. We had a big rain yesterday, so. The, the one thing about infrared, which I showed there at the end, infrared works at any time of the day and it really loves bright sun. Yeah. So if you can't do anything but go out at noon, take an infrared camera. Yeah, <laughs> camera yeah, camera. definitely. Um, we got a couple more. Um, how about legal action and putting street photos where many people are there? And this is sort of a lot like the one above it, which is, um, uh, would you need releases if you're in a stadium or a parade? Um, I think in, there's, there's like a expected public, um, there's an expectation that if you're, you know, say like marching in a parade or something that, you know, it's a public, yeah, you're yeah a public. it's a public place and, you know, it's, 
it's kind I mean, of expected that you'll get your picture. You know, technically, it's that way on the street, but again, it gets tricky when you make money from it. You know. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing, and and maybe he's talking about um, people that are standing on the side of the street, but I think it's expected. It's an expected thing that you're going to get your picture taken. Somebody asked, how can I change it to infrared? And to, to do the true infrared conversion, you have to send it to a, a place that does that. There's a lot of them around. The life pixel is, is because Heather and I are in the Northwest. Um, they're the one up here, but look, just Google, um, infrared conversion. What they have to do is take the infrared filter that's on your camera off and put a new one on. And so it's permanently infrared. You can yes. do it with a filter on the lens, but you can't, you're not going to do street photography with it. It's going to make your camera so dark. Yeah, it's going to, it's hard. Yeah. It's Somebody hard wrote that, that. Over, overcast is nature's light box. And that describes. <laughs> <you know. laughs> That's my favorite time to do macro too, is like an overcast winter days, like winter, I go into macro mode. Isn't <laughs> so, it, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Not that there's a lot of flowers around, but there are some. Um, but anyway, thank you, Mark. I think we're just about done. We had a very uh, healthy chat over there, um, sharing lots of info and stuff like that. But thank you. It's always a pleasure. And thanks to Ken Moore and you, Heather. <laughs> you are the legend. And everybody, <laughs> everybody, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your week. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.